Thanks for listening to this Word in Your Ear podcast. If you'd like to get early access to all our productions ad-free, priority booking for our live events, and to take part in our weekly quiz, go to patreon.com slash word in your ear for more details. Word down your way. You're such a lovely audience. And welcome to another Word Down Your Way, where we're joined by Graham Goldman of 10CT, who's about to embark on the ultimate, ultimate greatest hits (laughs) tour, of which more later. (laughs) To get ready for this, Graham, this morning, I dug out some old copies of um, my original 10CT albums, which you've no doubt got. And I want to ask ask you a question on behalf of, uh, of the nation. If you're in an alphabetical system of filing records, where do you put 10cc? Do you put it? Oh, under- you mean yes. Now, some people I know file under T, which yeah. is completely wrong. I think with numbers, you should file them at the beginning. Right. Okay. So it's in front of ABBA and Aardvark and everything else. <laughs> yes. There's a, a special section of those things that begin with numbers. Exactly. We should make a special study of that. Okay, (laughs) so can you remember, talking about live, can you remember the first act you ever saw? The first uh, one that I can remember was a very important gig. It was uh, Cliff Richard and the Shadows in Manchester. My dad knew someone that worked at the the theatre, and I can't remember what theatre it was, but managed to get me a seat with, and I went with my dad to see it. And I was already a, a massive Cliff and the Shadows fan. Um, and it was one of those gigs that sort of changed my life in a way. I was so blown away by it. Um, it was amazing. And actually, Years later, because my dad, I, I don't know whether I've ever mentioned this to you, but my dad used to help me with lyrics and came up yeah, with song yeah. titles and things. So he was a writer. Uh, not long after he, he, he died in, in 1991, um, my mum and I went through all his papers and we found a poem that he had written but never showed us, which I think he wasn't quite happy with it maybe. But it was beautiful and it's called Cliff and the Boy. Oh, and it talks about how I should have got it out actually, but anyway, I haven't got it uh, kindly. Um, it talks about how he he got the ticket and took me to the to the show and how it affected me. So, what was the line of the shadows at that point? So it's Hank and Bruce and Hank, Bruce, Jet Harris. Oh wow! Only me, and it was the original line. The original and, and, and Cliff, of course, yeah. Can you were you struck by the technology being a young lad who was interested in that? Were you were you looking at their instruments and amplifiers? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> that, that I mean, that's all we did. I mean, my when I was a, a like a sort of young teenager, my friends and I would go into town and go on to Oxford Road in Manchester, where all the all the guitar, all the music uh, in, musical instrument shops were, and just go from shop to shop. And there'd always be some sort of show off. Play, sitting on an amp playing away you know um and then of course we we went to gigs at night um because of course manchester's always been a, had a fantastic scene for music and just it wasn't for to go drinking or for girls it was to go and look at the the bands and then discuss the equipment you know uh, what amps are they using what a guitar is that you know <laughs> There's always blokes who do that at concerts, it strikes me, even to this day. You'll you see always blokes, get that. You can yeah. see them but before the gig, you know, if you pop out, you see, they're taking photos of the gig. You know, because on our gigs, we've got like a, a line of about 12 guitars. Um, and, yeah, people love it. Well, so do I. I'm a, um, there's a, a website that they send me um, uh, guitars for sale. They're actually based in Nashville. And uh, I'm often looking at it, and my my wife calls it uh, my guitar porn. This is it. This yeah, is and it. that's exa- that's what it is. It's a it's a it's a lifelong. You know, you can't have enough guitars. How many have you got? Well, I've only got about forty odd. <laughs> I know people that have got in excess of. Actually, I've got a, uh, my kids bought me a a book called uh, Mars Guitars. Uh, 
Johnny Mars, a book on Oh, Lord. right, there's a new thing. And he's got like over like 140 or something. So where do you keep your 40? Are they in your house? Yeah, some are in the house and some are with the uh, with the 10cc, where we keep all the 10cc equipment as well. Right. But now, most t- of them are here. So talking of equipment, when you were joining bands in, you know, I suppose the mid-60s or something, you're playing yourself, what kind of... What kind of equipment would you have? And w- would you have a PA, for instance, all the things no. that we now take for granted? <laughs> no, we wouldn't have a PA. We'd rely on that wherever we played to have a PA. I mean, when we very first started, uh, three of us would go into one amp. I mean, the famously people did that because who can afford three amps for the three guitarists? So it was a pretty horrible, distorted sound, but it was our sound and we loved it. Um, and the guitars, well, the ones we really lusted over were um, because of Hank and the, and the Shadows was the uh, the uh, legendary Fender t- uh, Stratocaster. Right, um, right. And I eventually got one. Uh, I used to keep it in my bedroom uh, with the case open. It would be the last thing I saw at night, the first thing I saw in the morning. And I still get a, and I think every guitarist who's a, strap fan and there are obviously millions get you look at that guitar and it there's you get a certain feeling about it it's kind of it's kind of love for it it's the most wonderful shape it was so revolutionary when it first came out and of course leo fender and there was someone else who helped design it i can't remember his name but they got it right the first time it's amazing it is extraordinary yeah they got the shape right didn't they never had to never had to play with that no 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 and, and many other guitars, but I won't bore you with that. No, right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so to the the ultimate, ultimate greatest hits tour, yes. why, why the two ultimates? Well, because I'm really taking the mickey out of the ultimate, you know. <laughs> and nine times out of ten, it ain't the ultimate at all, is it? It's not <laughs> the final, you know, and I'm just taking the mickey out of the ultimate, you know, the word ultimate. Of course, right. it's not the ultimate. Right. So this begins in, in, in March, which takes you through the whole of March. and you know, yeah. uh, starts in Bristol, goes through to Cardiff at the end of March, but it also includes the Albert Hall and so forth. What yeah, can, the 25th, yeah. Yeah, what can people look forward to, to getting from this? Obviously, the greatest hits. I mean, is there any <laughs> discussion about what the greatest hits are or, you know, between the bunch of you about what should we be doing this or that? Or, or is it yeah. pretty much set? It's pretty much set because the you know there's about eleven or twelve hits that we do. We do various album tracks. Um, I do a we do a couple of new songs as well. When I say, like one of them is um, a song I wrote uh, that was recorded with Brian May uh, last year called "Floating in Heaven," which is a song I wrote about the James Webb Space Telescope, and we do that. Um, And it's not a 10cc song, but people seem to, you know, we've been doing it for a while now and it goes down really well. And it's a sort of little bit of, adds a little bit of colour to the, to the set. Uh, But it's, I I suppose the album tracks that we do, those are the ones that I'm very careful about picking because there's so many to choose from. And really um, the, the ones that I've done have been tried and tested. So, so we do them. Why, where, what's it, what do you start with? What do you always start with? Is, it, is that We're, pretty much set? We, we've changed what we start with. We used to start with the Wall Street Shuffle. We now start with the second sitting for The Last Supper. Oh, right. right. Which is a very sort of rocky, raucous, a bit of a shock kind of thing. And um, there is one very interesting um, piece that we do in, song that we do in the set, which is uh, features Kevin Godley. Um, singing somewhere in Hollywood. He made a video especially for it, so he's singing, and we're accompanying him live um, to the video of him right. singing somewhere in Hollywood, and it's, it's, it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So as we, I hate to say you've seen a lot of changes <laughs> yeah, yeah. in live presentation, but clearly you have. I mean, I remember seeing 10 CC in the mid-'70s, I, I've got the uh, the original uh, round about the time of the original soundtrack, which I've got right. here, and I think you did one night in Paris, did you? Yes, we used to do that. Yeah. How did you do it? It's a long time ago. I can't. Uh, we've remember. always been very good at adapting 
what we recorded um, to, to, you know, being able to perform it live. Um, one thing we never did, which I, I think some bands do, they always go, well, we better not do it like this because we won't be able to do it live. We never did that. We just made the record for the record, yeah. you know, like whatever was best. Um, but you have to make compromises um, for certain things because there might be something that has, you know, like three ele three electric, you know, lead guitar parts and we've only got one player or two. So, yeah, you have to make compromises, but it's really the songs carry everything, you know. So I think people are, are uh, you know, allow for things to change slightly. Yeah, yeah. So you start with the second sitting for The Last Supper. What do you finish with? We finish with Rubber Bullets. Right, right. And that, that's kind of a like a slight bit of a jam in there. Uh, it's a great number to finish with. Right. Uh, we always have finished with that. Right, right. And uh, presumably the audience are up and dancing at that point. Is that, uh, they, Yes, they definitely are. Right. It's it's a great it's a great number to finish with. Right. So the the lineup. I mean, you got members. I was looking at this. You got Rick Fenn. I mean, how long's Rick <coughs> Fenn been part of Ten CT? Yeah, and so, I still I regard him as the new boy. <laughs> yes. Okay. I, well, yes. I suppose he is in a way. So Rick has been with us in, since 1976. Uh, when <laughs> Kevin and Law left the band, then and Eric and I continued as 10 cc and decided to go on the road rick was with us but paul burgess who's our drummer he's been with us since 1973 because <laughs> when we first the original band first went on the road um he joined us so he's really the <laughs> the longest standing member <laughs> and the, uh, when i say the new boys um keith Heyman our who's our uh, keyboard player. He's been with us for about 15 years. And Ian Hornell, uh, who sings as a multi-instrumentalist, uh, he's been with us for about, I think, about 10 years. <laughs> yeah. And, and and it's so a great, it's a great, it's, I have to say, it's a great band. It's a very, it's a musically and a sort of, it's a very, it's a happy band. We love what we do. We love them playing the songs. Really, we're, I'm lucky because the, the catalogue is so full of songs that have really with, withstood the test of time. And I think that's why we're able to, you know, tour now and uh, still do very well. So you presumably have reached a stage where you, can, you all feel really appreciative of the opportunity to do this, don't you? Oh, absolutely. It's a privilege. It's something that I love doing. I, I always say I'll never stop. I'll be stopped doing it because why i don't have any other sort of i don't play golf so i i, I all the, the three aspects of my life that i, I i'm privileged to to in, enjoy are writing songs recording and um and and playing live with the band that's what i love right so when you when you the band first do you know convenes for the beginning of a tour you're looking at each other going oh this is great yeah, isn't let's it? have it let's have it let's get let's get to it <laughs> yeah there's a there's an, an enthusiasm yes and right. it's lovely it's it's i think one of the aspects of it that uh i love is the particularly if you're with people that you really get on with is the sort of banter and the stuff that goes on but while we're traveling it's so funny it would make a great program but of course if you knew you were recording it it wouldn't it wouldn't no, work no. but it's such a lot of fun and um it's a privilege to do it so you're a gentleman of a certain age i mean you're, I not, you're not amusing yourself on tour in the way you might have done in the in your 20s i mean i have the foggiest what, idea what you're talking about <laughs> No, I'm just interested in what people do, you know, and in between before the gig. And I'll, so forth. I'll tell you what happened. Do people go and have a lie down and so forth? <laughs> right, yeah. Tell me about that. A glass of sanatogen. Um, <laughs> uh, what happens is we get in the van in the morning. We're travelling somewhere. There's lots of chatter, lots of banter, lots of then things go very quiet as everybody starts watching Netflix. <laughs> That's basically what happens. And then we get to the gig and it's we do a sound check. It's always the same. If, I, if someone goes, 
But what do we do next? So we're always the same. It's always the same. We're very <laughs> creatures of habit. And then uh, uh, between the sort of sound check and the gig, we have something to eat. And then it goes very quiet and pe some people will doze off. Some people, you know, we're on our dressing rooms making calls and everything. And then about half an hour before the gig, the whole atmosphere changes because we're getting changed and we meet up in the room and Rick and I always have a, a glass of wine together and you can feel the sort of adrenaline is starting and basically we're going into, I guess call it fight mode, but actually it's performance mode. It's, it's, but the dre adrenaline's there and we're ready to, um, to go on. And it's really quite exciting. And sometimes I'm at the side of the stage waiting to go, and I'm thinking, I'm really get, sometimes get a bit nervous. And I'm thinking, I don't need to do this. And then I get on and I go, oh, I know, I did definitely do need to do this. You know, it's like a quick change of mood. And uh, what do you do after the show? Does it still take you a while I'm, to wind down? Not really. We'll, we'll all change back into out of our stage clothes and meet up in the green room and have a drink and a chat. No, we do spend a lot of time together. Um, we, we have, um, you know, we'll have a drink together and then, oh, sorry, um, we'll have a drink together, talk about the show sometimes. So we, we never stop thinking about what the, um, you know, what we've done and how we can improve it. There's, it's never ending. Right. We, we're very finicky about things. Uh, and if necessary, we'll go, well, let's just check that bit tomorrow in sound check and make sure it's, it's okay. It's probably something that no one else would ever think about, but we know if it's right. something's not right. Right. Well, there you go. That's the 10CC Ultimate, Ultimate Greatest Hits Tour, uh, which may be coming uh, to your town, but it starts on, on the 7th of March, goes through to the end of March, and then, you, then you're in Europe and I think Ireland later in the, uh, later in the year. Um, uh, very best of luck with it. Good luck with the tours, they always used to say in old TV interviews. <laughs>